Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Seventh Day Church of Revelation. All right, would you like to turn with me as uh, we read our scripture reading today? It's coming from Psalm 139, verse 14. And it reads, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. All right, our, uh, our presentation this morning is going to be given to us by Brother Dustin Butler. Could this vitamin save your life? Brother Dustin, come on up. Good morning, everyone. As uh, Guy already mentioned, the title is Could This Vitamin Save Your Life? And this presentation is going to be a lot different than what I'm used to giving. Um, I am not a healthcare professional in any sense of the word. I'm just uh, someone who uh, is interested and curious about certain things. And when I ran across this information, I actually shared it with a lot of people that I, uh, that I know, and uh, it changed some things uh, in my life, and so I wanted to share it with all of you too. Uh, another thing that I want to mention before I start is that I will be talking about uh, different types of diet. I'll be mentioning meat, I'll be mentioning dairy, and vegetables, and supplements. And I don't want you to believe I am in any way endorsing meat and dairy by doing so. But it is an important part of the presentation because it will teach us about this particular vitamin that we're going to be looking at today. So just wanted to make that perfectly clear before we start. So before we go any further, let's uh, kneel once more in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day and for the ability to come together and, and worship you freely. And I just want to ask a favor from you that the words that I say would not be confusing or, or unclear, but that they would be a benefit to uh, the body and that they might serve to, uh, to help and to uh, inform uh, as many as possible uh, if there needs to be anything uh, that we need to change in our, in our own diets, in our own life. And I pray these things not because I deserve to have an audience with the King of the universe, but because your son died to purchase that right for me. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. Amen. All right. One last thing. I want to put this disclaimer up on the screen. Uh, because this video will be posted, Lord willing, to YouTube. And we want to make it clear that uh, any information that I give uh, or cover in this presentation, that, um, that you would consult your trusted healthcare professional before making any changes in your diet or any medications or any lifestyle. Uh, alterations that uh, you would consider because of this presentation. I just wanted to make that, that very clear also. So why is a vitamin so important that uh, it would make me want to, to share this information with you, especially here in church? Well, there's one big reason, beside the fact that we all want to live healthy lives, and it is this, uh, this situation cardiovascular disease. And this particular quote comes from the World Health Organization, and it says that uh, cardiovascular disease, or CVDs, are the leading cause of death globally, taking an estimated 17.9 million lives each year. CVDs are a group of disorders of the heart and blood vessels and include coronary heart disease, Cerebro, cerebrovascular disease, rheumatic heart disease, and other conditions. 
more than four out of five CVD deaths are due to heart attacks and strokes. And one third of these deaths occur prematurely in people under 70 years of age. And so this is a really big problem. And if you are facing these type of numbers, when we look at statistics of death, it's something that we should do everything we can to prevent. So our next slide comes from the National Center for Health Statistics. And it is regarding heart disease. It says, heart disease is the leading cause of death for men, women, and people of most racial and ethnic groups in the United States. One person dies every 33 seconds in the United States from cardiovascular disease. About 695,000 people in the United States died from heart disease in 2021. That's one in every five deaths. And that was also a time where a lot of deaths were being attributed to something else, right? So that number is likely low. Heart disease costs the United States about $239.9 billion each year from 2018 to 2019. This includes the cost of healthcare services, medicines, and loss of productivity due to death. So with that being said, we realize how serious of an issue this is. Next, we're going to look at a man who was far ahead of his time regarding the study of this vitamin we're looking at today. His name was Dr. Weston Price. And he stated, the quality of our food determines in large part the quality of our lives. And the quality of what we eat is determined by every step that goes into production and processing. So he knew that what we put into our bodies matters a lot. And he was a dentist. They called him the Charles Darwin of nutrition. And that is not because necessarily he believed in evolution, but it was how he approached the study or science of what we're going to look at today. He was born in Canada, but practiced dentistry around Cleveland, Ohio for about 50 years. In 1925, with a newly purchased camera to document his findings, he embarked on a worldwide tour of remote places to understand why some cultures got cavities and tooth decay, and some didn't. The locations that he traveled to included Swiss valleys, Peruvian Amazon, New Zealand, the Andean Sierra, Alaskan Inuit, and Australian Aborigines, and other, other places too. So let's look at just a few of the photos that he brought back in, uh, after his trip. This first photo, you see I have it divided into two sections, photos on the left and photos on the right. Photos on your left are those that, uh, whose diet consists of a more primitive, um, less processed foods. And the pictures on the right are a more modern and western diet. And so you see the effects uh, of, of this, and he was clearly seeing it, and he wanted to get to the bottom of it. So you see there on the left, you have uh, very straight teeth. I know my teeth were not that straight without, without braces. My teeth probably resembled more of the teeth on the right, and maybe some of you can say the same thing. The other thing he noticed is that those that ate a more natural, primitive diet had square faces. Their arches were uh, healthy, and they tended to not have any cavities. And this was not the case for those that we'll be seeing on the right, right side of these samples. Here's another. Those on the left, nice straight, straight smiles, nice wide and broad arches and, and symmetrical faces. And uh, those on the right, some obvious issues there with, with their arches and crowding of teeth. One more sample. Nice big smiles there, showing how symmetrical and, and nearly perfect those teeth are. 
on the left when they abstain from our Western diet and eat simple, non-processed foods. And then you see the samples there on the right with those that uh, eat the Western diet. So now we're going to look at several things that Dr. Price found in, uh, in common with each of these two dietary groups. So each group had certain things in common. The groups on the right side of the photos ate foods that can be transported long distances and stored without spoiling. Rice, white flour, sugar, vegetable fat, canned goods uh, caused irregular teeth crowded, uh, crowding and, uh, I'm sorry, irregular teeth and also crowded dental arches and cavities. He decided it was the absence of some essential factor. He knew it was something in their diet. Healthy traditional diets, those that were on the left, had four times the mineral and water-soluble vitamins and 10 times the fat-soluble vitamins in their diets. Aside from A and D, which were known about in the 1930s, he identified another fat-soluble vitamin in their diets that he called Activator X. So it didn't even have a name yet. Dr. Price concluded that it was present in fish eggs, egg yolks, organ meats, and butter fat of cows eating rapidly growing green grass. He created his own Activator X by combining butter oil from cows eating grass in the spring with cod liver oil. So he made his own little uh, home remedy that uh, he hoped to mimic, that would mimic the, uh, the diet of these people groups. As a result, he stopped filling cavities in his practice. Teeth were healing on their own. He published x-rays before and after uh, being treated with Activator X. It wasn't until 2007, 80 years later, that the connection was made between the Ohio dentist with this natural remedy and vitamin K2. So that's the vitamin we're looking at, K2. Vitamin K is a family of vitamins similar to vitamin B. You know, not, not all vitamin B uh, vitamins in the vitamin B family are the same. They each have their own specific um, functions that they perform in the body. Vitamin K1 is the more commonly known uh, vitamin K, but we're taking a look at vitamin K2 today. Some of the things known about vitamin K1 is that it is a blood clotting agent. And uh, you may have known people, or maybe yourself, you've uh, taken warfarin, or also, call, also known as Coumadin. Uh, it blocks K1. So it actually um, thins the blood. Uh, some people also know it as rat poison. That's, the, that's what we feed rats, and it thins their blood so much that they, that they bleed to death. And so that's, that is a, a drug used to thin, to thin the blood. Uh, K1 is made by our own gut bacteria and is very rare for us to be deficient in K1. You don't hear about it a lot, and most of the time if we have decent uh, gut bacteria, uh, we don't have any issues with a deficiency in K1. And another thing that can affect us is an overconsumption of antibiotics can cause a K1 deficiency. So that's something to watch out for also. Now let's take a look at K2, some of its characteristics. K2 activates proteins responsible for calcium and phosphorus deposition in bones and teeth. So deposition is just the deposit of those things into the bones and teeth, so that's very important. It directs childhood and infant growth by preventing premature calcification of cartilage and bones. It activates proteins that cells are signaled to produce by vitamins A and D, and maybe you've heard that K works with both D and A. They work together. This is where uh, osteocal osteocalcin 
and bone growth come in. And we're going to mention and look at osteocalcin in the next slide. It also protects the mouth, teeth, and gums through the saliva. saliva. Dr. Price noticed a 90% reduction in saliva bacteria when K2 was present. Here's some more, <clears throat> more uh, items about K2. It protects against calcification and inflammation of blood vessels and the accumulation of plaque. So that's very important. That's probably one of the most important characteristics of this uh, K. It helps make the myelin sheath of nerve cells improving brain function. And so we're going to look at the very end of the presentation what that uh, might mean for many people. It is essential for proper facial development with full arch and less crowded teeth. And so then you uh, tend to look at what is the mother eating before she becomes pregnant. And also the, the men in some of those uh, people groups uh, were aware of this. And so the, both the men and women would get the best butter fat and the best meat and the best, all the best dairy and meat because they knew that it was going to affect their children uh, that, were, that they were hoping to have. Uh, it's also a dramatic insulin, insulin reducer, and the, its effect is through osteocalcin activation. And we're going to see what that actually is soon. So until 2007, the health community had not really identified the difference between vitamin K1 and vitamin K2. They just assumed that both were blood clotting factors and that there was nothing special about K2. So they just lumped them in together. So any, if you look up on the internet, um, what, what's the daily recommended dose of K? Even if you put K2, you'll get the K results. So you'll get a, a dose of what, how much K you're supposed to take in each day. There really isn't an official a K2 recommended daily dose, and that is because the research is so new. And, um, but you're, you're able to find those who have done the research um, presenting what they believe is the, is the best amount of K2 to take. So the next thing we're going to look at is called the calcium problem. Some people called it the, uh, uh, the, the calcium, I think it was the calcium dilemma or something like that. And in April of 2011, a study was published in the British Medical Journal, and it concluded that women who take extra calcium for osteoporosis are at greater risk of heart attack while only slightly lowering broken bones. So there was virtually no benefit to their bones, which that was the primary reason they were taking it in the first place. The study followed 61,000 Swedish women for 19 years. This is a huge, huge study. Most studies are done with, with far fewer people than this. Both issues, low calcium in the bones and calcification of the arteries are caused by inadequate K2. So this is all connecting with that first statement, those first two statements that we, we saw on the leading uh, causes of death in both the world and here in the United States. Uh, the study found that, uh, that their bones got practically no benefit while they consumed more than 750 milligrams of calcium a day. So that's, that's quite a bit of calcium. Here are some additional uh, items about K2 and what it can do for us. It modifies two proteins that are otherwise inert and they become activated with K2. One is called, called osteocalcin, which binds calcium into the bone. It's like a glue that helps calcium absorb and, and uh, become part of the bone. The other is called MGP, matrix GLA protein, which fishes calcium out of the arteries. So that's huge. 
if you have something that can actually go in there and take this calcium that doesn't belong in your arteries, you know, if you take a lot of calcium, it's flowing through your blood system. And if you don't have uh, these proteins activated, you have nothing to take it out of the bloodstream, and so it just keeps, uh, it stays in the bloodstream and it attaches to the arterial walls with some other elements and becomes plaque. So if you don't have this osteocalcin activated and the MGP activated, that, uh, that calcium has virtually no other place to go but your arterial walls. Here is a, an image of, of plaque in the arteries, and you can see how it narrows the, the pathway there for the blood to flow, and this causes a whole host of problems uh, with one's health. Arterial plaque is made up of deposits of fatty substances, cholesterol, cellular waste products, fibrin, which is a protein, and 20% calcium. So calcium plays a huge uh, role and uh, is, a, is a large, large percentage of, of that plaque. Now if you look at bone, the bone in our bodies is also calcified tissue composed of 60% inorganic component made of almost half calcium, 10% water, and 30% organic proteins. So you see a, a real big connection. And those, uh, those plaque deposits in your arteries uh, mimic bone. They are almost the same makeup as, as bone itself. And that's why you get a stiffening and a hardening of the arteries because of that stiff substance in there that's building up. This, uh, this next quote is from Time Magazine from 2005. And the article was titled, How to Stop a Heart Attack Before It Happens. It read, first, it was blood cholesterol that could give you an early warning that a heart attack might be around the corner. Then came uh, C-reactive protein. And now that doctors can get a better look at what's inside your heart and arteries, they are taking a new interest in something they have always known was present in, uh, in problem vessels, calcium. And so you can see how recent this was when doctors were just realizing what it was that was causing heart disease, it was killing so many people. They're just at this time realizing that calcium had something to do with it. Calcium that was in the wrong place. This information comes from the Journal of Nutrition from 2004, and it was citing a study called the Rotterdam Study. And uh, those involved in it took 45 micrograms. These aren't milligrams. This, uh, microgram is a thousandth of a milligram. So 40, 45 micrograms of K2. And here were the results. 50% reduction of arterial calcification. 50% reduction of cardiovascular death. A 25% reduction in all causes of mortality. And the, the statistics are just um, astounding. And this is as compared to a low intake of dietary K2. So this, uh, this vitamin makes a huge, huge difference, or can make a huge difference. Not even the most powerful statin drugs produce results even close to this, or anywhere near, or anywhere close to this. 25, uh, a 25% reduction uh, of death at best from, from the most powerful statins. And those statins also come with side effects. And those include headache, dizziness, nausea, diarrhea, muscle pain, insomnia, and low blood platelet count. Uh, with K2, you get no side effects. So that seems, seems to be a no-brainer. Uh, this Rotterdam study, we mentioned how large the other study was. This, this study had 4,800 patients and followed them for 10 years. So also a very, very large study. This headline and um, quote comes from 
PubMed, which is a website that has uh, published medical articles that are peer-reviewed. And the, uh, the title itself is startling. It says, statins stimulate atherosclerosis and heart failure. That's a huge, huge claim for, uh, for an article that has been peer-reviewed and is, is published on this site. It says, in contrast to the current belief that cholesterol reduction with statins decreases atherosclerosis, we present a perspective that statins may be causative in coronary artery calcification and can function as mitochondrial toxins that impair muscle function in the heart and blood. It goes on to say that statins inhibit the synthesis of vitamin K2, the cofactor for matrix GLA protein activation, which in turn protects arteries from calcification. So you have statin drugs being prescribed to fix a problem that scientists are now saying that it is causing. So very, very, very serious and very important information to have. So this is not to say that anyone should go off any medication that you may be on, including statins. I'm just sharing this information uh, to provide you with recent findings. Um, a lot of the studies are, are very recent, and um, they're still trying to conclude, you know, what is the best dose and um, how uh, vitamin K2 might interact or react with other things. And so far, there don't s seem to be any, um, any risks involved with K2. So make sure, again, like I said before, to uh, consult with, with your trusted health professional before making any changes. So what foods have vitamin K2? Uh, butter beef, and some cheese from cows fed and finished on green grass. And uh, what I mean by finished is that they would have eaten that grass their entire life. You know, you can have your cows out in the pasture once a year and say they're grass fed, but that doesn't really, that doesn't really cut it. They need to be fed and finished. They need to live in that environment and uh, graze on that grass. Also, eggs and some meat from truly free-range, grass-fed, and finished chickens. And uh, the other source is some fermented plant foods, but most of these are not a significant source except for one. And we will take a look at that in a little bit. First, we're going to uh, read a couple quotes from uh, Dr. Whitcomb, he is the individual where I obtain most of this information. So one of the reasons uh, that I want to cover before we go to his slide uh, is how have Western diets become so deficient in the things that I just mentioned? Well, it's because that our cows, cows are fed grain instead of grass. We also feed our cows... Um, cotton seed, and um, if you ever see the trucks that are going down the road and they have all that puffy cotton seed, cotton seed in them, that's, that's future, or could be future a cattle feed. And one of the primary reasons why farmers feed the cows cotton seed is if you feed them that particular oil, then the butter that they produce will be able to be left out on the counter without refrigeration. You ever seen butter just sit out on the counter day after day after day and nothing happens to it? Gets warm in the kitchen, doesn't matter, just stays there. Well, French butter is not like that. The French don't like the taste of our butter. Their butter is grass-fed and finished. And if you leave it out on the counter, it just, mm, just melts. So. Um, not only is it a better tasting product, according to them, but it, um, it actually is, is better for you if you have to make a choice between the two. So now let's take a look at Dr. Whitcomb, and he's going to uh, tell us something about uh, 
something called the French Paradox. First, we're going to look at uh, what he has to say about hip fractures. American women break their hips at 50 times the rate than women in less industrial societies. If you compare Norwegian and Scandinavian women with fine bones with women who live indigenously in New Guinea, the rate of fracture is 1,100 to 1. So it's not, even, it's not even close. So we can see that there's something drastically different here. Here's the French paradox. He says, there has been a lot of teeth gnashing in American cardiology the last 50 years because the French are just degenerate in their diet, that is. Every food they eat, ingredient number one is butter. And they have half the heart disease we do. And then he says, bingo. They're eating grass-raised butter. They have half the heart disease we do. This is not a trivial issue. So they can get away with eating butter and have no heart disease. And then he says, guess how many heart attacks the French have? Half of that of Americans. So what if you are, and I know I'm speaking to a lot of them, vegetarian or vegan? How do we get this vitamin K2 if, if we don't want to eat butter or we choose not to eat meat or dairy? And there are two, what I believe, two good solutions for that. And one is very easy to consume, and the other is not so appetizing. So the first food that we're going to look at is the one that's not so appealing to everyone. And it is called natto. How does that look to you? It looks a little gooey, right? It kind of looks like something that you would find in the back of your fridge, and you're like, wow, what is that? And then you open the container, and you lift it up, and that's what it might look like. Well, that's because this is fermented soybeans. And that is, that is what it looks like. That's the texture. Um, this natto was discovered in Japan in the 11th century. Soldiers uh, were being attacked, and they were at the time boiling soybeans to feed their horses. They threw the beans in a sack of straw and went about their, their battle. Uh, the men, uh, after three days, they had not eaten, and they uh, happened upon that same camp and returned to it and found the the soybeans still in the, in the sack, but they also found this sticky substance around the beans that they had thrown out. Their hunger level was enough to make them still want to eat the stuff, and the rest is uh, Japanese culinary history. So these soldiers were from the northeastern part of Japan, around the area of Tokyo. And so to this day, in that area, natto is a delicacy. It's enjoyed by most of the people that live there. But all you have to do is go to southwest Japan, and those people cannot believe that others in their own nation will eat this stuff. So, I mean, we have things like that probably here in America, and maybe some of us won't eat some of the things they would eat in the south or vice versa. But um, that's, that's the fact about Japan, is that... Um, uh, those in that area uh, acquired a taste because those men that came home from those battles wanted their wives to make this because this is the substance that saved their lives. And so it just grew from there. So let's now take a look at some of the benefits of K2 and the other way that you can get it, and that is by supplementation. And the reason why I believe that supplementation is a good idea are the following, or the reasons. You can control and know exactly how much you are getting each day. If you're eating natto, you don't really know that for sure. You don't know exactly how much K2 you're getting in a serving of natto. You can approximate it, um, but that's, that's as good as you can get. And there, next, there is no need for being tied to eating a certain food every day. You would have to eat natto every day to keep those levels up. This, this vitamin doesn't store up in the body. And uh, we'll see uh, 
a little more about the different types. There's actually different types of K2 even. So not just different types of K, but specifically different types of K2. And the other reason I believe that supplementation is or can be a good idea is that it's very inexpensive. It's not an expensive thing to obtain. One thing to know about K2 is that it is often said that uh, it works with D3, and we know that to be true. And here are two examples. I'm not promoting these particular, but I use them as an example because this particular company offers both of these uh, items in a K2 only and a D3 plus K2. And I just wanted to share with you uh, the uh, the benefit of taking only K2 by itself. And that is you can control the dose. So most of the studies that, um, that I ran across were for individuals that were taking between 45 and 300 and I think about 340 micrograms per day. Well, this particular K2 has 200 micrograms. So if you took two of those a day, you would uh, be equaling that upper, upper level of most of the studies that, that have been done. But the one on the right includes 500 international, or 5,000 international units of D3. And so now you're tied to that. If you take that one and you want to take 400 micrograms of K2, you're gonna to have to take four of those particular pills. And so that would give you 20,000 international units of D3 a day, which some would argue that's not, that's not a whole lot, but there are some that would say, if you take too much D3, you can become toxic. So, and that, that can be the case. Uh, one thing that's interesting though is that uh, the reason that you can become toxic is because of a lack of K2. And so if you're, if you're taking them both, there's, there's probably what I have read, uh, less, less chance of you becoming toxic. But that's something to be aware of. The other thing also is that um, you will naturally get more D3 in the summer months than you will in the winter months. So your need for D3 can fluctuate, whereas your need for K2 is level. So if you take them separately, you can have control over that. So those are the reasons why um, I believe it's uh, more wise to take K2 by itself. Now, the other thing I want to mention is that there are, like I said before, two types that are readily available of K2. There's something called MK4, and that <coughs> mimics the, the vitamin K2 that you would get from animal products. And that particular MK4 has a, a half-life of 3.5 hours. So it goes into the body and it, it uh, is out very fast. It doesn't stay there very long. Now MK7 mimics that that you would get from natto, which is super high in K2. So you have kind of the uh, animal product mimicking source and the uh, the plant uh, K2 source. And so many believe that MK7 is a, a better K2 to take. Its half-life is 72 hours, so it's far greater than, than the MK4. <clears throat> the other thing that is good about the MK7 version of K2 is that it actually can break down into MK4, because the, the numbers um, are explaining how long this, the chain is, the molecular chain, and that's why K7 has a longer half-life, because it's a longer chain. And so the shorter, the, the MK4 has a shorter chain, and so this, it has a, a shorter half-life. And it, so as the MK7 breaks down, you also get MK4, so it's all around a better choice according to, to most. Here are some other benefits of K2. 
And uh, these are going to be the last two slides we look at. But here are some interesting um, studies that are, are being done on different, um, different conditions that many have. The first being Alzheimer's. Um, they have found that there is a strong osteoporosis and Alzheimer's association. Alzheimer's patients consume 50% less K2 in their diets. So they're seeing a direct link so far to Alzheimer's. Skin wrinkles, that might have gotten some of you interested. Japanese women who eat a diet including natto have less wrinkles than age-matched women who do not. Varicose veins. A lack of GLA protein causes bulging and reformation of veins. Diabetes. K2 has the ability to cut the insulin levels in some, a oh, little typo there, in some patients in half. And so that helps, can help in the regulation of insulin. Here's some more. Rheumatoid arthritis. RA patients are often shown to have coronary artery disease and osteoporosis, so doctors are seeing a correlation there that is undeniable. Multiple sclerosis, vitamin K is found to promote the myelin sheath layer around the nerves, and so that's, that's really huge. Prostate cancer, and that's also being studied for other types of cancer, but prostate cancer is the most prominent. There was a study called EPIC, it's the European Perspective Investigation into Cancer, and this study found that those with the highest K levels had a 30% less risk of cancer. That's very big. And our final uh, condition here is kidney disease. K deficiency is common in this condition. All right, so as you can see that, uh, see here that uh, vitamin K2 has the potential to uh, change a lot of lives. If just a, a portion of this were true, it would be worth looking into it. And so when I ran across this information, um, I happen to know a few people that could potentially benefit, it, benefit from it. And just the fact that uh, heart disease is a leading uh, killer and cause of death is enough for um, all of us to consider uh, this, this vitamin moving forward, even if you're in very, very good health, because it's very difficult to get it from diet and know exactly how much uh, you are consuming. So I, I hope that this information, I believe it's groundbreaking information that, that we've seen, uh, is a blessing to you, and I pray that it further convinces all of us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for being our creator and our great physician, and I pray that that some of this information, at least, would be a benefit to uh, your remnant and that, that it might help prolong our lives, but not just to prolong our lives for, for longevity's sake, but that we might have more time and more energy to complete the work that you have given your remnant church. We pray these things in the name of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you've been blessed by this video, please like, subscribe, and comment below. To support Seventh-day Church of Revelation, visit revelation.org.